Good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the Royal Statistical Society's Professional Statisticians Forum. Uh, my name is Trevor Lewis and I will be chairing today's meeting, uh, which is entitled Research Ethics Committees, the Role of the Statistician. Um, I am a member of the Professional Affairs Committee of the RSS, which is the committee responsible for professional matters and as such is responsible for the Professional Statisticians Forum series of events. The presenters at today's meeting are Chris Foy and John Kirkpatrick. Chris is a medical statistician working at the Gloucestershire Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust and is also chair of the Oxford B Research Ethics Committee. And John is uh, employed as a statistician at the Global Contract Research Organization, PPD, in the pharmaceutical industry, and is a member of the Cambridge South Research Ethics Committee. There are three slide sets posted on the PSF webpage, PSF standing for Professional Statisticians Forum, um, and that web page is www.rss.org.uk forward slash PSF. So if you're only on the call via a telephone, you need to make sure that you have access to those three slide sets uh, from the RSS website. Okay, so I'm going to uh, introduce the meeting by um, just setting the scene a little bit uh, and I will be stepping through um, a small number of slides to um, provide that, that context for the meeting. Okay, so let me first of all then on my second slide talk about the origins of this meeting. Uh, in November of last year, we held a workshop which was co-sponsored by the Royal Statistical Society and the uh, Health Research Authority, uh, the Health Research Authority being the body which is responsible for the work of ethics committees uh, through the National Research Ethics Service. And um, that was a workshop to consider the provision of statistical advice to research ethics committees and looked at two aspects of that statistical input, the input um, and review of applications to ethics committees uh, by statisticians and also looked at the contribution of statisticians as members of research ethics committees. The workshop um, led to three action streams which um, we are progressing at the moment. One was looking at how we might improve the statistical quality of submissions or applications to research ethics committees. The second was looking at how to promote the involvement of statisticians as members of research ethics committees. And the third action area was to provide a regular forum for uh, ethics committee statisticians to meet and discuss their experiences and issues. We, um, let's just move on then to the next slide. Um, we're going to focus today, of course, on the second of these three air action areas, promoting the involvement of statisticians as members of research ethics committees. And um, in doing that, we're, this isn't the first step in that uh, set of actions. Um, some of, them, of you will be aware that um, there was an article in the Stats Life um, Bulletin in March, in fact it was the 19th of March Bulletin, which um, talked about the opportunities for statisticians to join research ethics committees. And um, if you click on the link on this slide, then you will, it will take you to that article. Um, in addition, of course, if, if, for example, you can't get access to that link, then if you simply uh, go into any uh, browser and type in opportunities for statisticians to join research ethics committees, it will take you to that article, I'm sure. Now, in that article, there are two links which are worth mentioning. 
One is a, an HRA adver advertisement for um, vacancies for statisticians on research ethics committees, which is certainly worth uh, looking at if you are interested in joining a research ethics committee. It gives contact details and, talk, and gives you uh, uh, information uh, that you might need if you are considering joining uh, a research ethics committee. And the second link on there is a link to today's meeting, uh, which is our if like, second aspect of pursuing that action of looking at um, promoting the involvement of statisticians in research ethics committees. So moving on to um, my next slide then, um, I just want to just uh, re-emphasize um, how you can get access to the slides and if some of you are currently only linked by telephone and want to join the webcast, how you should do that. Um, the presentation slides for today's meeting, as I've already mentioned, can be downloaded from the Professional Statisticians Forum webpage, and I'll repeat that at www.rss.org.uk forward slash PSS. And as Chris and John give their presentations, they will mention the slide number on the slide that they are discussing for the benefit of those of you who are only joining the audio part of the meeting. For those of you wishing to join the web portion of the meeting, uh, a link to access the web conferencing system can be found on the PSF webpage. Moving on to my next slide, which is headed after today's meeting. Uh, I just want to uh, clarify with everybody that this meeting is being recorded so that we will be able to post a webcast as well as the slides on the past events subpage of the PSF webpage and the web address is given on this slide. Now, following this meeting, we want to try something new to these um, PSF events and that's to allow there to be follow-up discussion um, on the topics that we've been, that we've been covering uh, in the meeting. And this is via the forum on the Stats Life website and some of you may not be familiar with the forum so I'll just very quickly talk about how to access it. So if you go to the Stats Life website um, then uh, on the home page, on the top right hand corner, there is a members tab and if you select professional statisticians forum from the drop down menu, that will take you to a screen where you can select PSF events forum and um, there you can see the conversation, post meeting conversation um, uh, and Q&A discussion. Um, now, if you just go and look at that, then you can see the discussion that's been taking place. But if you want to contribute yourself, you'll need to create an account, which is very straightforward and can be done from that web page. You do not need to be a member of the RSS in order to create an account and contribute to the discussion. Okay then, so the last uh, of my introductory slides then um, is um, simply to uh, comment on the structure of today's session. Um, we're going to run the session with the two presentations from Chris uh, and John following immediately and then we will save the Q&A discussion until the end of the meeting. Um, now, all participants are initially muted and when we get to the Q&A discussion part of the meeting, you can unmute by dialing star six to make your contribution. And please wait to hear that you've been unmuted before asking your question. But after making your contribution, please mute again, again by dialing star six. Now for those of you using the web conferencing option, you can ask your question verbally over the phone line, as just described, or alternatively, type your question using the Q&A interface at the top of the screen. 
during, and you can do that during the presentations if there's a question which you want to capture at that point, or immediately after the presentations. We'll give you a few minutes in order to gather your, gather your thoughts and put your questions down using that interface if that's the approach you want to use. And finally, as an introduction, I just want to mention that we would be very grateful if you would give feedback following this meeting, and you can do that by using the poll tab, again at the top of the screen, uh, to record your feedback on today's session. I should mention that your name and email address will be linked with your feedback, but please rest assured that your feedback will be treated in strictest confidence. Okay then, so we can now get underway with the subject of the meeting and I'll ask Chris to come and start his presentation. Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much to Trevor for your introduction. And I would actually like to begin, if this doesn't sound too crawly, by paying tribute to Trevor for bringing together the RSS and the Health Research Authority communities in a way that hasn't really happened before. There have been one or two attempts to get us together, but it's never really quite happened. So, that by way of starting, I hope to take about 20 minutes, and uh, those of you not on the web system, you should have my set of slides with the words statisticians on Rex on the first slide. And I do apologise for using an acronym right there in the title slide. That is, of course, Research Ethics Committees. It's such a, a well-known acronym in this field that it's quite easy to slip into it. Okay, so I'm just going to... What we thought we'd do is that if you are considering, however tentatively, joining a Research Ethics Committee, we thought it might be nice if you actually heard from a couple of working statisticians who are on committees. So I'm going first. Onto my slide two, how I got started, and we're going back 20 years. I had then a consulting job in an NHS hospital, actually Mount Vernon Hospital, and I wasn't very familiar with research ethics committees then, though I had in a previous job, had some brush with them in the days when, if you ran a big national study, you had to apply to lots of different research ethics committees. Happily, those days have gone now apply to only one research ethics committee, however widespread your study is within the UK. Anyway, at that time I shared a corridor with the research ethics committee chair who was a lay member, no medical or professional, health professional related background. She kept plaguing me with statistical queries. This went on for about four months and eventually she said, well, why don't you join us? It would be much easier. So I did, and that was my recruitment process, just a brief conversation between the chair and me. But that was in 1995, that was really, ethics committees were almost laws unto themselves in those days. Since then, the Central Office for Research Ethics Committees was created in 2002, I think it was. That became the National Research Ethics Service, which has now in turn become the Health Research Authority. And we had a note around the other day actually to say that uh, they're trying to discontinue the use of the acronym National Research Ethics Service in favour of Health Research Authority. So I have checked my slides to make sure they comply. So let's uh, move on to the third slide. What happened in the following 20 years? I've been a REC member continuously for that time. Uh, that's been seven different research ethics committees. Uh, and in my second spell of chair, as, a, as chair of the committee, I uh, was chair of a committee, a regional committee that met in Taunton for three and a half years. Uh, then I had to stand down as a chair because I was pursuing further postgraduate studies. That was finished, I came back, offered to be a chair again, and then, by then it was much more formal, and I had to travel for a panel interview after which I went in a waiting room, but I was only in the waiting room for two weeks before they telephoned and said, would you like to join Oxford B Research Ethics Committee because their chair has just left. So I did. And after all this time, I reckon I've seen 
2000 and counting studies, and I've done some other project work for the Health Research Authority, in particular on, uh, there was a pilot of um, providing pre-meeting advice to research applicants, and they wanted to see whether it speeded up the time for how many days it was until you got your answer having applied. The answer to that was, no, actually, it didn't speed things up, but it had other benefits. And just to say that my NHS employer, Gloucestershire Hospitals, does see the benefit of my being on a research ethics committee, therefore it does provide me the time to go to the meetings. Actually, I'm on two committees. It doesn't provide the time for the second committee quite reasonably because there's probably no incremental benefit in that second one to them. But they do provide me the time to carry out my meeting and chair duties for the Oxford Committee. Okay, moving on to my slide number four. Uh, what's involved from the point of view of a research applicant who wants to carry out a piece of health-related research, what do they have to do to get started? Well, obviously, first they design their study, write it down in a protocol, but then there are certain things that they need to do, and it's best if they're done in the order that I've indicated here. First, sort your funding out, whether that be industry funding, drug or device industry, whether it be a grant from say the National Institute for Health Research, which incidentally is the largest health research outfit in the world. I have to put that in. And, or it might be a charitable grant. Or you might be going for internal funds within your own organization. But whichever it is, get your funding sorted out first. Then, according to the Department of Health Research Governance Framework, there is a body called the Sponsor. That is not necessarily the person who pays, so don't think of sponsored walks and getting money in. It's not that use of the word sponsor. But the sponsor is responsible for the scientific quality of your study and for making sure that you're a suitable person to do it and that the study goes along all right and gets conducted properly and written up at the end. This is all written down in the Department of Health's Research Governance Framework, which has been around since 2004 and the Health Research Authority, who are now responsible for that framework, are about to issue a revised version of it. But we await that. Then, assuming your study involves NHS patients or NHS carers or, num or falls into a number of other legal categories, such as it's using tissue regulated by the Human Tissue Act and one, two other areas, and if it's a drug study, it comes to a research ethics committee whether or not it's in the NHS. So you can have a drug study in private patients at clinics. That would still come to the research ethics committee. All those kinds of studies, you apply and you get an opinion. After that, it's up to you to obtain management approval at each study site, whether that's an NHS site or another kind of site like a university or a contract research organization. And another strand of health research authority work, which we shan't discuss today, but will be very prominent in the next few months, is that they're bringing together the process of management approval of studies, so that the kind of questions that need to be gone into only once, such as whether the study complies with the Data Protection Act, will be looked at only once and not covered by 27 data protection officers in 27 NHS sites, which has been the case up till now, and 27 Data protection officers, of course, have at least 28 opinions between them. Moving on to my slide five. So, the sponsor, there are the managers at research sites, but what's the distinctive role of the Research Ethics Committee within this process? Well, we're acting as a proxy for the interests of people who might take part in the study, because they can't take part yet, but we can imagine ourselves into their position and see what happens and see if we think what they're being asked is reasonable for them, a fair ask. And also, 
by contrast, the sponsor, who I mentioned before, it is their job to assess the science of the study, make sure it's up to scratch. It's not, strictly speaking, our job as the Research Ethics Committee to be the primary assessors of the science. And also the sponsor is responsible for the study as it goes along. We as the Research Ethics Committee don't get involved in monitoring the studies uh, minute by minute or even month by month as you go along. The sponsor does that. Slide six. So the Research Ethics Committee must therefore perform a balancing job. We have two substantial roles, one of which is to promote and encourage good quality health-related and medical research, and the other counterbalancing duty is to protect the interests of participants. And we try not to let one of those dominate the other, because obviously if we protected the interests of participants to the exclusion of science, basically we'd say, don't carry out any research, that'd be potty. And if we went to the other extreme to say that research predominates over the interests of the participants, we'd be going against the World Health Organization's Declaration of Helsinki, among other matters, and we would then ourselves be acting unnecessarily. So we need to strike a balance. We need to balance the benefit the study could bring to advancing time scientific knowledge, and also the benefit to the individual participants, which may or may not be present. We need to balance that against the risks and inconveniences to the participants, whether those risks are drug side effects or inconveniences like having quite a bit of their time taken up and having to fill in burdensome questionnaires. There's no fixed rule for striking that balance. If there were, we could be replaced by an algorithm and we wouldn't need to be asking for more statisticians to join committees. But that is not going to happen. I don't think uh, artificial intelligence is going to get there within the next 50 years, replace us. One day it might. But at the moment we have a variety of views around the ethics committee table. Uh, slide seven. How do we then discuss the study when people have filled in their online application and sent it to us? Well, one or two members of practices vary. It's either one or it's two members of each committee who will be assigned to each study to introduce it to the other members by giving a succinct summary and then saying what they say are the main issues in the study. Then we go around the table and the other members will contribute their views. Then we invite the applicant in to discuss with us. Most applicants do choose to attend the meetings or are invited, that is Health Research Authority policy and has been for a few years. Most come and most, in retrospect at least, are pleased that they did, though we understand that it can be quite a daunting process at the time to be placed by 12, 15, at the extreme 18 members, all of whom might ask a question. The discussions are usually pretty well informed. Members have had a variety of professional and life experiences which they do bring to bear on the studies. And we do get strong views, and they can lead to passionate debate among ourselves, sometimes even when the applicant is in the room. And after the applicant has left, we come to a decision about each study, whether we will say, yes, favourable opinion, you can go ahead, or, hang on, we want to ask you one or two questions in writing and have some correspondence. That's called a provisional opinion. Or we might, in a few occasions, actually say, sorry, we don't think this is an ethical study as it's presently proposed. Uh, unfavourable opinion, please take it away, and by all means, if you wish, try again with a modified proposal. Now, there are something like 70 committees across England and more in the devolved nations, and you might think that you would get the same answer whichever committee you go to, but actually you might not necessarily because committees are composed of individuals and those individuals have views. But the Health Research Authority is concerned to make sure that we are in some ways standardised, not that we're identical, because then we'd be heading back towards the algorithm, but that we broadly cover the same issues when we look at a study. And to that end, they hold periodic, what are called shared ethical debates, where 12, 15 recs all get the same application. It's usually a past application that used to be live and is now on their system. And we will all discuss it, and we will minute our discussion and those minutes will be shared, assessed by the Health Research Authority. They will work out how many of us raise each issue, whether we missed important things. Those exercises have been going on for five or six years. 
function. There's only a subset of us who are allowed to review studies with drugs. Those are ones that have been legally recognized to do so. And there are some other types of studies which I've listed on this slide which are best directed to a research ethics committee that regularly sees them because that will improve the way we handle them and will, one hopes, give a better response to the applicant. And those categories for which a certain number of committees specialize are medical devices, which is a very wide-ranging category, everything from a plaster to uh, an implantable cardioverter device that will give you a shock if you're about to cease your pulse. So it covers a very wide range. It also covers external devices, such as blood pressure monitors. So a very big category. It's also any study involving adults lacking capacity to consent for themselves. There's particular legislation around that, the Mental Capacity Act, and certain committees have been particularly familiarized with that and uh, concern themselves with those issues in a way which there wouldn't be the expertise if we all tried to do them. Similar issues for children. It's best to have pediatric expertise on your committee if you want to uh, look at studies involving children. Studies involving research tissue banks set up for continuing holding of tissues under the Human Tissue Act. That's a specialized concern, as is research databases. And there are just a few committees, I think only three in the UK, who specialize in prison-based studies, health research going on among prisoners. And obviously there are particular concerns there about freedom to consent or to decline. So it's very popular that there should be a few committees who specialize in those. And lastly, qualitative research. Some committees used to have a bad name for asking questions like, well, your sample size in this qualitative interview study of six people isn't representative, is it? But it was never meant to be. And there were some misunderstandings. So some committees who have qualitative researchers on them are trained to do those particularly. That's slide nine. I mentioned before that it's the sponsor who assesses the science, not us particularly. And equally, it's not really our job to assess the value for money of the research. We do sometimes see what yet another study from the same drug company with yet another drug uh, for a particular cancer where life expectancy perhaps isn't that great anyway. And we think, well, you might want to spend millions on that drug, but I'm not sure that life is ever going to buy it on behalf of the NHS. So is it really good investment? But that is not our direct concern. That is the company's concern. We will still review the study, even if we think the company is wasting its money. But we do have a problem if thereby the participants' time and goodwill are misused when there isn't much prospect of any great advance coming from the study. So actually we do need to be assured that the science is sound and we look to the sponsor to give us that assurance. And if a study really is poor science, then by definition there can be no benefit to society, and therefore that we would not see that there's any acceptable level of risk or burden to participants. They would be conducting a futile activity, and we don't want them to do that. So in that case we would say, if the science is poor, don't do the study. Slide 10. Uh, what do we do as statisticians who sit on RECs? Well, basically, we provide assurance to REC members that the proposal is statistically sound, assuming it is not a qualitative proposal. Interestingly, if it is a qualitative proposal, members still turn to us to assess the soundness of the qualitative methodology. So I've had to learn a bit of that as well. Uh, if necessary, we take part in quizzing the applicant and we will, if a sample size calculation is presented to us, I would certainly personally always recalculate it to make sure it looks right before the meeting so that I can provide that assurance to uh, committee members. Interestingly, it is not always correct according to the assumptions stated. But I don't reckon it's my job to assess whether the effect 
regression and the blinding are as good as they could be, whether there's a decent analysis plan, whether they intend to publish in a suitable forum rather than squirreling the results away. And as I said, we are seen as the wide-ranging methodological experts and we have a pretty big brief. Correspondingly, that gives us a lot of power and we need to exercise tact and diplomacy in using that power. And just a word of warning, if you stay on too long and show too much interest in matters, you will end up as a research ethics committee chair and you'll have lots of extra fun. Uh, slide 11. The statistical quality of the proposals can be quite varied. Now, I tend to find that the ones coming from the drug industry, they have a lot of in-house expertise and they're pretty good usually. Uh, the small and medium enterprises which more typically are promoting medical devices rather than drugs, they can be a bit more varied, but usually pretty good. Studies funded by one of the major grant givers, for example, the Medical Research Council or the various branches of the National Institute for Health Research, those studies have always been subject to a lot of independent comments. Six referees have gone over them, so as a big grant panel, it would be pretty surprising if a methodological flaw had got through all that lot. They're usually pretty good. One or two of the smaller grant-giving bodies, especially the charities, need a little bit more care and attention when looking at what they have produced. And probably the own account studies, that's coming from staff within the NHS, and also students from universities, typically master's students. They do tend to need a bit of a careful look. They can be rather variable. <laughs> and here's an example. I didn't, this is slide 12. I didn't actually write on here that it was a student study. And just a small protection of confidentiality, but it was. They were proposing a case control study, and they had consulted remotely a statistician in their university. They were proposing, it was a study on um, a risk factor in pregnancy. But by the time they got to write their rec application form, they'd misunderstood what cases and controls were in such a study. And the cases had become people with a risk factor, and the controls were the people without the risk factor. And since it was a rare condition, they really didn't have nearly enough what we would properly call cases in their study, and it was all going to go wrong. And I doubt very much whether the statistician had reviewed what was written on the form, but they had been consulted. So before the meeting, oh dear, I read my papers and I noticed this thing, and I realized that there was a misunderstanding and nobody else had seen it. So I explained to my fellow committee members beforehand that there was a problem, I was going to have to address it, in fairness to everyone, and obviously I had to be very tactful when doing so. I did not want to reduce the student to tears. Regrettably, I have seen that on a number of, very few, number of past occasions. That didn't happen on this occasion. I invite the student to go away and have a face-to-face -face meeting with the statistician. And a few weeks later, the proposal came back with that feature, sorted all out, so it was done. So that, I reckon, was a good outcome. Who are we as the statisticians? Slide 13. Some of us work for the NHS, typically in the research arm of the NHS, some are academics, quite a lot from universities, some are from industry, some are self-employed consultants, some are retired and they can provide quite distinguished service, and indeed you don't have to be a medical statistician to be able to contribute pretty soon to the work of a research ethics committee. But our big problem is there really aren't enough of us to go around, we would like more. That's why we call today's meeting. So just on slide 14, I want to set out what you might expect if you were to join. There are presently 11 meetings per year of a research ethics committee that is about to decline to 10, and we accept that not everybody can attend every meeting. What happens in a meeting, there will be anything from four to six studies. There used to be many more than that. Five years ago there were 10, and there were tales that uh, 10, 12 years ago, committees tried to get through 30 studies in an afternoon. You really can't do justice to them if you do that, so things are much more sensible now. So four to six studies, we might be there for three, maximum four hours, and obviously you've got to read them beforehand. So those are the studies that are dealt with actually in the main meetings, but there is a class of 
simpler studies, studied, studies that are held to have no material ethical issues. They get dealt with by subcommittees outside the main meetings, and they're subcommittees of three people. That is called proportionate review, and after you've been on the committee for a few months, you might be asked to join one of those subcommittees. Uh, your expectation is that you should attend two-thirds of the number of meetings in a year. Uh, that's allowed to decline to a half if you take your fair share of these subcommittees. But it's better if you attend all the meetings you can, and you will be made welcome. The Health Research Authority also offers an organized programming program of training, both initial induction training for members and refreshers on quite a wide variety of subjects and you're expected to attend one day per year or self-certify that you've um, done related reading. Uh, slide 15, what are the perks? Well, you get your expenses of travel, you get a lunch, uh, varying quality depending on uh, where your meeting place is. If you get an invitation to the Northamptonshire Committee, which meets in a stately home, take it. Uh, as an intellectual workout every month. I find that to be the case anyway. But the Health Researcher Authority is not going to pay you. Your employer, your employer might implicitly be paying you for the time you spend, if so, good. And I think we also find that it's good for professional development. You'll be exposed to a vast variety of studies, different statistical methodologies, and also different qualities. So, it sharpens your mind. You will also be offered mentoring by an existing statistical member. One of the results of the meeting we had last year is that, um, yes, it is recognized that statisticians on committees who will probably be, almost certainly be the only statistician on their committee would need mentoring by a statistician on another committee. So that is currently being set up. And my final slide, just to say that Rex do a vital public service uh, balancing interests of science and of participants. I find the role to be a very satisfying one, giving me a buzz. We need more of them, more of you. It's not essential to have a medical background. I think your employer ought to see the added value, and it really is rather fun, so I hope you will think of joining us. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I'm going to hand over to John, who will take a slightly different take. years behind him. <laughs> um, I'm going to cover some of the same material as Chris, but hopefully from a sufficiently different perspective that you will still be able to gain something from it. Um, the National Research Ethics Service, or HRA, as Chris explained, is involved in protecting the rights, safety, dignity, and well-being of research participants and facilitating ethical research, as they say on their website. And as Chris pointed out, there's nothing in that mission statement about the quality of the science that's being done. Uh, we're primarily focused on the participants and their well-being. But that's not to say that the quality of the science doesn't come into it in order to assess the benefit of the uh, research both to the participants and to society as a whole. Uh, my slide three. Uh, a, a little bit more admin. Chris said there are about 70 recs. Um, NRES believe there are 68 at the moment because I think uh, a couple have died recently. Um, and they are organized via five regional centers that basically do the admin and the paperwork and the photocopying uh, for us. Uh, one of the things that uh, will change in your life if you join a rec is the, uh, the number of times the postman has to knock on the door to deliver uh, reams of paper once a month. Uh, that's all done by their operations team and overall there are around um, a thousand ethics committee members um, in England and they also have uh, advice from the National Research Ethics Advisors Panel, 
who offer opinion from time to time. My next slide. Um, the ethics committees themselves are appointed by an NHS authority. As Chris explained, we meet almost monthly and have up to 18 members on them. And certainly on the committee on which I sit, most members attend most meetings, although there are minima, minimum standards that you're required to attempt to achieve. It's not that difficult. Um, we've, Chris and I have both talked about uh, lay members, expert members, and lay plus members. That seems to be important to the HRA and to NRES. Actually, within the meeting, it is utterly irrelevant, as I will mention later. And quite often, a lay member has considerably more expertise in the specific area being discussed than anyone else on the committee. Statisticians are mildly interesting in that we are the only profession who could be either expert or lay. The difference is simply that if you have an active involvement in clinical trials, you are regarded as expert, otherwise you are lay. Uh, but as I said, it's essentially an administrative difference. And my next slide, slide five. Um, turning to a more personal approach, I had been interested in, in joining an ethics committee for a while simply as a way of, uh, as I saw it, giving something back to the research process. Um, but I found it actually quite difficult to find out how to do so. Um, I eventually discovered the NRES website, uh, but that was intended primarily for users about the process of um, ethical review. There was very little information about how to join, and in the end I resorted to the old-fashioned technique of picking up the phone and asking someone. Having found out the information that I needed, uh, my application was straightforward and fairly simple, though a little more formal than Chris's. Uh, there was a form to fill in. I did need to provide the uh, names and contact deals for details for referees. Uh, I came down to London for a face-to-face -face interview, and the interview process was effectively I was given uh, a basic previous application to read uh, for half an hour before actually speaking to the people that I was speaking to, and I just had to talk sensibly on it to them. Um, I was reasonably confident the interview had gone well because the final question from the chair of the interview panel was, uh, we need more statisticians, would you be willing to run some training, sir? Of course it's for us. Uh, having been accepted um, within NRES, I was then given the choice of around uh, a dozen recs, and I'm now on slide six, that had somehow, and uh, in a manner that I still don't understand, expressed interest in having me join them. Uh, they were spread widely uh, from London to Leeds. There was a wide variation in meeting times and durations. Um, Chris said that he doesn't expect his meetings to go on for more than four hours. I would be delighted to have a meeting as short as that. Um, we generally, uh, in the Cambridge rec that I did join, uh, we meet basically for the full day. Uh, but others meet in the mornings, other meet in, others meet in the afternoon, others meet in the evenings. So with the variation in geography and time of meeting, it is quite likely that you will be able to find something that would fit in with whatever personal constraints you need. I, in my own case, I chose Cambridge uh, mainly through geography. Uh, I, I live close to Cambridge. At the time of day, I quite fancied working during the day and not in my evenings. And I had this nebulous, uninformed, but as it turned out, justifiable suspicion that the applications to a Cambridge committee would be interesting, and indeed they did turn out to be so. Uh, moving on to my next slide, slide seven. When I joined 
the Cambridge South REC, I was actually working as a freelance statistician uh, with my own company. And so it was easy to get employers' permission to uh, take time off to go to the committee. A year later, for various reasons, um, I took a proper job and started working at PPD. At the time uh, that I was being interviewed by PPD and, and continuing, I wanted to remain on the committee. It was an important issue for me. Um, and I, I said that I would want to remain part of the committee during the interview process at PPD. And I said so expecting at least some resistance. Um, but in fact, I was completely wrong in that respect. Um, my employer were very supportive as, they, as Chris's. They give me the time to attend the committee as part of my um, job description. I do the preparation for it in the evening, uh, so that's on my own time. And they regard it not least um, as good PR for, for them as a company. But specifically, moving on to my next slide, it gives them a warm, fuzzy feeling that they're being good corporate citizens. But it, they also get benefit internally as well. Um, I have been asked by other employees who are making um, ethical ethics submissions how a particular feature of a submission might be um, viewed and what were the things that ethics committees focused on what, what, and so what should they focus on in order to get a smooth um, process through the application system. Uh, specific clients have raised questions that I have been able to say, uh, well, I can speak as a member of an ethics committee and that would be a problem or that would not be a problem and it has helped them therefore speed up the preparation for an ethics submission. And personally, I take a lot of satisfaction from it, um, not just the intellectual uh, satisfaction that Chris has talked about, but also I feel being on an ethics committee means that I am regarded as not just a statistician, not just someone who, uh, you know, unless kept carefully in, uh, on a leash, will uh, degenerate into stat battle at the earliest opportunity. I, I'm a more rounded human being because of it. Uh, so I, I, I gain benefit in my, in my interactions with people at work. My next slide, slide nine. Um, Chris explained what a rep reviews. Uh, it's set out in law. It, it, in broad terms, it's any research in the UK that involves NHS patients, staff, or facilities, and the other uh, categories that are listed on the slide that Chris has mentioned. And also from the start of this year, um, apparently social care research, although we in Cambridge have not had any of those studies yet. Uh, my next slide, slide 10, the researchers are anyone who does research in those categories, which can range from MSc and PhD students through individual clinicians uh, or surgeons employed in the NHS with particular theories that they wish to try out or changes to their processes that they wish to ex um, explore. Pharma and biopharma, uh, national health initiatives, um, the most high profile of which in recent months I would guess is the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, which has uh, obtained a great deal of press coverage, I think, and that would have had to go through ethical review and approval. And an interesting one that came to my committee in particular was for a, a, a convoluted set of um, particular practical circumstances in the northwest of England. Uh, there was a water, uh, a reservoir that was uh, essentially going to be fluoridated that hadn't been fluoridated in the past. And that presented, um, in, in the words of the researchers, a unique opportunity to um, establish the benefits or otherwise of uh, generic water fluoridation, uh, and so that required uh, approval as well, or review. So there's a vast uh, range of studies that we look at, and that is interesting in its own right. 
Uh, my next slide. Um, an important consideration is that the review should be appropriate to the purpose of the research and to the facilities available to the researchers and the risk to the participants. And that means, put in simple terms, that you, it's not always appropriate to expect the same rigor, not just in statistics, but in research standards in general, of an MSc student as it would be for uh, a multinational uh, confirmatory drug trial or, or even a, a, a national research project. So my next slide, slide 12, and this is a quote from my uh, committee chairman who said, virtually the first thing he said to me when I joined the committee was that all research is ethical if consent is informed. Um, and yes, that's a, a sweeping generalization, but in, in essence he is correct. And that's brought out by the, uh, the statistics of opinions that ethics committees deliver. And on my next slide, slide 13, um, you will see that actually around 94% of ethics submissions eventually gain approval or are at least not rejected at the first hurdle. Um, but even though 90-odd 90, 90 percent go on to gain favorable opinions, only 5 percent of them do so at, at the first attempt. Uh, and I think that's realistic <coughs> because um, any clinical research, any research is complicated. Any project that takes 100 pages to describe is going to have some sort of issue in it, even if it's purely administrative. And when you have a dozen people looking at it, each with their own view, there will be a number of reasons why uh, people would like even just a single word changed. One, one of the things that we focus on particularly is the information sheet and pro using appropriate language. And one of the things that gets uh, under the collar of ethics committees is any in implication of, for example, coercion or um, being selected to be taken part in, in, a, in research as a reward or, or a benefit. And, and so if you tell a potential participant that they have been selected or chosen, that will get an immediate comment from any ethics committee because there is an, uh, an overtone of coercion or reward. Um, generally, you, use the, you need to use very neutral language along the lines of invite. So it's simply using the wrong verb on an, in, on an information sheet will move you from a favorable opinion to favorable with conditions or further information. So it's very, very difficult to get through on your first attempt and it's nothing to be ashamed of if you don't. Uh, moving on, my next slide, slide 14. Um, what does make a bad application, it, we're obviously talking as statisticians, it's very rare that a problem with an application is purely statistical. Um, in my limited experience, almost every quote, bad application has had problems in more than one area. And it, it still amazes me that during the round table discussion that Chris described in his presentation, when we're talking about an application, the degree to which the various members of the committee do agree and the speed with which they reach that agreement, I still find surprising. It, it, it is remarkable. Um, the, the uniformity of opinion on an individual uh, application. And an another thing that I think is, is important to say as a, if you like, an area expert, and our area clearly being statistics, is, is that methodology in that one specific area is rarely a deciding factor in making, making an ethical opinion. As, and as a simple example, for me, whether or not you use a Z test or a T test or a rank sum test is not an ethical issue. Uh, ethics are, are, are wider than whether you're using 
the absolutely most efficient statistical technique. It's, it's all to do with the, the, the risk-benefit ratio for your participants. Um, so on, on that note, my next slide is a, a, a header. I'm going to give, spend a little bit of time talking about um, some real examples that have come to the Cambridge South Committee that I sit on where statistics has played some part in the decision or the recommendation or opinion that we reached. And in highlighting these examples, I'm not saying that they were all bad or that they all led to unfavorable opinions. I'm merely saying that statistics played a role in where we ended up. And the first one, I, I called the over-enthusiastic researcher, uh, not least because he, uh, he is a regular client of ours and comes to us about once a quarter with various ideas. He's a surgeon, and his, this particular um, study that he wanted to run uh, was involved with uh, ablation or, or the removal of uh, arterial plaques in, in the coronary artery. Uh, and this is a, a surgical technique which, in which a device is inserted uh, via a catheter in the thigh up through the various blood vessels uh, to the heart where this particular instrument delivers a pulsed current to the plaque and therefore destroys it. Um, the device has settings for both the, uh, the shape of the pulse and the strength of the pulse, um, but there was no guidance in the manufacturer's documentation about what the optimum settings were or what um, factors you should take into consideration in deciding what, which, what settings to use. Uh, the device is already in regular use, um, and so to me that implies that if there were any differences between the settings, they would be small, uh, because otherwise people would have noticed already. The application was, um, in, it, in concept, very good. He considered um, the, the, the risks to the patients and how they could be ameliorated. He uh, considered how um, to explain what was going to happen to the patient and how the consent would be obtained. And he had even gone as far as to set the experiment up as a, a two by two factorial. So the statistics were reasonable as well and it was all looking you know, really quite positive. Um, but in talking to him, uh, he said that he had about 30 subjects a year come into his clinic that he thought would be suitable for the study and that he needed this study as uh, part of his surgical registration and that needed to be done in a year and so therefore his sample size was around 30. Um, bear, bearing that I said previously that I thought changes, differences between the various settings in, on the device would be small, that clearly wasn't enough. And on top of that, the device manufacturer who he had visited and discussed the study with, and in fact copied um, the manufacturer's study, uh, was indeed, the manufacturer was indeed running another study of 160 subjects. So there was clearly a, a, a problem over the, um, the risk benefit to the patients in his study, given that a better study was already running. Moving on to my slide 18 now. This was um, a, an exploratory study actually being sponsored by a relatively small charity, um, actually outside the UK, which was looking at uh, prophylactic treatment to reduce the risk of post-surgical bleeding events. Um, and curiously, for me at least, both the current and the proposed prophylactics were also associated with the bleeding event they were trying to prevent but at a rate that was much less frequent than the surgery alone. The, um, the sponsor was proposing to do a primary analysis based on a modified intent to treat analysis set, and their modification to the standard ITT was that they would exclude patients who did not have surgery. And obviously one of the reasons they might not have had surgery was a bleeding event associated with the treatment. So, uh, that was an issue that we felt needed discussion. A, uh, on my slide 19, this caused me 
quite a bit of an internal discussion within myself. It was a, a industry-sponsored clinical trial for an investigational medicinal product, a CTIP, and the sponsor had been very honest. He had said, we have a power in excess of 99% for our primary endpoint. And my use of quotation marks on the next bullet is not to indicate a direct quote from him, but in other words, in the application, they essentially said, that we know we are horribly overpowered, but we need the sample size in order to generate the exposure required for the safety database, which the regulators had insisted we obtain. So you've got two competing um, priorities there, the, the, the benefit to the society overall in getting a new effective treatment for the condition on the market and the potential exposure of patients within the trial to an inferior treatment. And the thing that decided me on it personally was that would I have known had the sponsor submitted two different studies of half the size that were each appropriately powered, that wouldn't have presented a problem to me. So could I object purely on the basis of being overpowered? Um, and I raised that as an issue with the committee and overall we felt that we were happy with it, that it was something that we needed to talk about. The, uh, the next example is, is fairly similar to, to Chris's example. It was uh, a pilot study for a variation in surgical technique. I'm now on slide 20. And this particular student was using a, a, a pre- and post-operative assessment. Uh, he had done a power calculation that was, seemed perfectly reasonable. He'd given me a reference effect, a standard deviation, 90% power, two-sided significance level. He needed 22 subjects per group, and he was using a two-sample t-test. But he was also looking at pre- and post-operative assessment, so why hadn't he paired it? And given that he was claiming he could get 90% power, why was it a pilot study? So, similarly to Chris, I, I suggested that he uh, took some advice from his uh, local pain statistician. On a more wide uh, topic, and I'm now on slide 21, rather than issues with individual uh, presentations, what comes up uh, as, as a general theme is equipoise, um, which are originally was um, defined by Friedman to, to mean that you genuinely have no prior knowledge about which of the treatments you're intending to use are better. And Friedman claims that effectively you need to have equipoise in order to do ethical research. If you take that approach, then there is a case of saying that almost all confirmatory phase three clinical trials are not ethical because you are already of the opinion that your treatment is better, otherwise you wouldn't be running the phase three program. Miller, on the other hand, says that ethics of research and ethics of treatment are different and you need to build the, um, the potential benefit of, to society into your assessment. And um, it's not a statistical issue, but there are discussions about do we genuine, genuinely have equipoise in, a, a, in an individual assessment. And it's an area that I, I do find interesting. Um, a statistical, now on slide 22, an area of statistics that I, I'm personally very interested in is adaptive design. And adaptive design also introduces new uh, problems for us in the ethical um, framework because it changes the ethics of clinical trials. And the examples I've given here are that if you're using a play the winner randomization or some sort of adaptive technique that results in arm dropping or any group sequential design with a superiority endpoint, all of these designs imply a greater chance of benefit to the individual patient when that patient enters late in the study than compared to entering early in the study. 
given that the average man in the street has trouble understanding randomization and the most complex explanation we normally see is that it's like flipping a coin, how are you able to explain those concepts in, in a, uh, an information sheet and thereby obtain informed consent? I don't know personally. Um, and finally, and another bugbear of mine on, on slide 23, are there some designs that are simply just too bad to use and you could consider them to be unethical? The one that is a particular bugbear for me is the 3 plus 3 design, which to me, in my experience, is usually run simply because everyone else is running a 3 plus 3 design with no real understanding e either from the investigator, the sponsor, or the, the patient of the problems that it introduces, both in terms of in information, um, safety, and benefit to both society and, and the sponsor in the long run. Um, I always feel very uneasy whenever I see, it, see a 3 plus 3 design, but personally I don't feel able to blackball it simply on that basis as much as I would like to. And finally, just a couple of comments from the workshop that was held at the end of last year. The two things that I came out of it for me as being important, or the most important, were that one way of getting more um, statisticians available for ethics committees would be to obtain academic credit for statisticians within universities for their work that they do on ethics committees, which uh, I didn't realize was not given at the moment. And secondly, a, a number of people who have been used as statistical referees and subsequently have been contacted by RECs about applications turned out not to have known anything about that application in the form it was submitted, uh, which is rather worrying. So, thank you for listening, and I'm going to hand over to Trevor now to chair the uh, Q&A session. Okay, well thank you very much to Chris and to John for two very um, excellent, informative and comprehensive presentations on uh, the work of statisticians in ethics committees. Um, I suggest that we get straight underway with the Q&A session. If those of you need a little bit of thought about um, uh, your questions, then maybe you can use the Q&A. Uh, application on the uh, on the global meat um, system, uh, and those of you who are ready to, waiting for your question, uh, maybe you could uh, ask it verbally over the phone. Uh, and remember, when you do that, you need to press star six to unmute before asking your question, and then remember, once you've asked your question, to mute again, again by pressing star six. So, um, if So, could I, um, okay, could I ask uh, whether anybody has a question to ask verbally? Uh, well, while we're, so, uh, we have a question um, asking uh, whether there are any favorite books or texts on this topic. Uh, maybe ask Chris or John whether they know of any. To be honest, I don't think there is a specific book or text describing what we've been talking about, the work of statisticians on Rex itself. Perhaps we ought to promote one. Uh, you will find a wide variety of materials on the Health Research Authority's website, hra.nhs.uk. Don't be put off by how clunky the site is. It takes about a minute for any given page to load. But there is a lot of interesting briefing material on there. And yet there is <coughs> excuse me, there's quite a lot of academic literature discussing the ethics of studies. Indeed, there are journals devoted to that. But they don't very often consider the statistics specifically. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that um, specifically discusses statistics and ethics, um, although in terms of equipoise, 
I mean, just a, a general search on equipoise will bring up some interesting um, articles, and I, I can provide the, the full references for um, Friedman and, and Miller if, if you can put them on the website later on, Trevor. Well, maybe we could put them in the um, on the forum. Yeah. When we're, when we're having the post meeting discussion, that would be a good thing to pop that. Uh, we do have a second question raised. Um, and not, yeah, I think it's probably based on the last slide. Oh. So it's for John. Uh, <laughs> briefly, what is a 3 plus 3 design and in what application is this used? Okay, I, I'm sorry for not explaining that. Um, a, a 3 plus 3 design is, is the most common first in man study design, particularly in oncology, um, where the treatments tend to be highly toxic and, and it's a a difficult decision to work out whether the benefit that the treatment is giving is better than the adverse effects of the uh, toxicity associated with it. And the 3 plus 3 um, essentially describes what happens. You start at a low dose, uh, you treat three patients, and if they tolerate the drug, you up the dose a bit and treat three more, and you keep on going and this is a gross simplification, and I apologize to uh, people who are more expert in it than I am. Uh, and you keep on going, essentially, until you get two out of the three subjects at a dose experiencing uh, unacceptable toxicity. And when that happens, you um, declare that the maximum tolerated dose is the dose below that. So inherent in the design is the knowledge that you will be overdosing subjects quite deliberately. Although you don't know you're doing it at the time, that's the net effect. Um, there are various variations you can do on that to, to, to tweak it, but essentially that's what you do. And again, there, I think John, you've mentioned before to me that there is a literature around the relative merits of a 3 plus 3 design. With, with various other... Uh, usually Bayesian techniques, but other options are, are becoming uh, available. There's, there's an academic called Ivan Nova, I believe her name is, at Chapel Hill in North Carolina, who has come up with something called the Rapid Enrollment Design. Um, oh, quickly, CRM, Continuous Reassessment Method Design, is another option. Um, obviously, these are, are early phase studies, so they're never going to give you definitive answers. But they, the, the operating characteristics of virtually every other design is superior to the 3 plus 3. But the 3 plus 3 is still the most commonly used. Thanks. Sorry, that was a little off topic. Yes, before we go too much into yeah. methodology rather than ethics. Rare indeed, yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Tim, for your comment and your response. Okay, um, could I ask whether anybody else wishes to raise a question verbally over the phone line? Or indeed via the Q&A system? You, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself if you're using the phone. Okay. While we're pausing for that, or people are furiously typing in the Q&A system, maybe I could ask the presenters a question. Could, could, could you just talk a little bit about how you deal with potential conflicts of interest? I guess if, if um, statisticians working typically in the medical field are, are the statisticians who, who might most likely join the ethics committee, um, how do they deal with potential conflicts of interest? Okay, shall I start with that one? Uh, yes, the HRA does have set procedure for committees to deal with conflicts of interest. Members are expected to declare anything, however tentative, which they think might influence their assessment of the particular application. And there are three possible routes of action. One is that the committee resolves that the member may remain and take a full part in the discussion. Two, that they may remain but only to be questioned about the application and not vote or three, that they leave the room altogether. So um, that is the set process. Uh, and yes, it is generally the same <coughs> community who are promoting the studies and are also reviewing the studies. 
provided it isn't the same person doing both roles in one study. <coughs> that is normally considered okay. Obviously, quite often you will know the person who is submitting the study, but provided you have not worked on that individual study, you would still mention that you know the person, and the committee would probably rule that it's okay that you continue assessing that study. Uh, incidentally, no member of the committee may bring their own application to that committee. It must go to another committee. Yeah, I, I would agree with Chris. Um, the only other thing that I would add is it's not necessarily the case the committee will vote. Occasionally, the individual member will remove themselves. And, and in my experience, we, we do take it fairly seriously. Um, a, a lady on uh, the Cambridge South Commission once excluded herself from uh, discussion on a study because her husband played golf with the husband of one of the principal investigators on the study. <laughs> and she regarded that as sufficiently conflicting that she needed to withdraw. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question here. Um, are there any instances where ethics committees over here, I guess that's in the UK, liaise with equivalent bodies abroad? Um, the Health Research Authority is involved in a lot of European cooperation. Uh, there is a body called the European Federation of Good Clinical Practice, which obviously relates particularly to uh, drug studies, uh, to which the UK has made a very big contribution. And indeed, the new EU regulation on clinical trials, which has already been published and is coming into force sometime next year, has been substantially influenced by British contributions. But we're asking whether ethics committees communicate directly with each other on individual studies. The answer to that is no. Um, each study, if it's a multi-country study, requires one ethical opinion per member state within Europe. So that may change. That's changing. <laughs> yes. Perhaps you want to describe in what respect it's changing. Uh, I can't. <laughs> um, Briefly, there will be a lead uh, country for coordinating the responses to a, a multi-country application within the EU, and that will start sometime next year. The, the other thing that I would add is, is that rather than um, contacting other ethics committees or uh, uh, regulatory authorities in other countries, we can, if we wish, contact the researchers or the applicants directly. Indeed. Um, and in fact, the, the statistical um, re reviewer or resource that the applicant has used has to be identified on the application form and their contact details given. Personally, I haven't felt the need to contact an individual to discuss a specific study yet. Um, but I've certainly considered it on a couple of occasions. Mm. Yes, I've done it very occasionally, yeah, when something is really quite unclear. Sometimes a 10-minute conversation with the named statistician on the application, they've considerable misunderstanding and discussion in yeah. the IT. But also, uh, having worked both within the pharmaceutical industry directly and currently as a CRO, um, I, I know the effect that a contact from a pseudo-regulatory authority would have within the organisation and I would be very uh, loath to, to put an unsuspecting individual through that. Yes, the power to be used sparingly. Yeah. Okay, well thanks very much. Any other questions that people either want to raise through the Q&A on the um, global meet or verbally over the phone? Okay, if not then I will start to close the meeting. One of the things I want to stress as we've lost one or two participants is that before you leave the meeting it would be great if you could leave some feedback using the poll function on the um, uh, using the poll function at the top of the screen and um, uh, and to just leave your comments there that would be, be excellent if you could. Uh, to leave us with some survey results. What I would like to do uh, in finishing, though, is just to remind you of some of the comments that I made at the beginning of the meeting. For those of you who were not uh, necessarily joining us uh, right at the very beginning, um, I uh, have a slide on the screen now, which is the third from my panel, just reminding you that um, there is 
if you are interested following this meeting in applying to become or showing further interest in becoming a member of a research ethics committee, then there is this HRA advertisement which can be accessed via the Stats Live article, Opportunities for Statisticians to Join Research Ethics Committees. Uh, and that advert gives the contact details uh, where you can get an application pack. And it also points out that if you are potentially interested, then you can go along to an uh, ethics committee meeting as an observer in order to see whether it's the sort of uh, process that you want to um, take part in and want to uh, take your interest in joining the committee further. Um, I'd like to also um, remind you that um, following this meeting, probably within seven to ten days, a webcast of this meeting will be placed on the past events subpage of the PSF webpage on the RSS website. Uh, but also remind you that there will be future PSF events, and these will be advertised on the PSF webpage. The next event that's coming up in June is on the 4th of June, and it's entitled A Conceptual, Technical, and Practical Framework for Missing Data in Longitudinal Clinical Studies. And it's uh, a presentation given by the winner of the 2014 RSS PSI Award for Statistical Excellence in the Pharmaceutical Industry. We do plan after June to have a further three events uh, in the PSS series of events, and so these will be posted later in the year, so keep a look out on this webpage for further information. And my final uh, comment is to remind you that we'd like to carry on the discussion and conversation about this topic we've covered today. Um, using the forum on Satslide, and uh, as we've already mentioned, John will um, be uh, adding some thoughts there uh, in response to a couple of the questions already raised. So please take a look at that, and please do contribute uh, by creating an account and adding your own thoughts, comments, and questions. Uh, so finally, then, I'd like to thank Chris and John very much indeed for their presentations. Uh, thank you for listening and being part of the meeting and to uh, wish you well and hope we will hear from you and see you again at a future PSF event. Thank you very much indeed.